Good morning, everyone. Page number 442 this morning in your psalm books this morning. Good to see all of you out in church today. Page number 442. Let's find us a seat this morning and begin to worship the Lord today. Page number 442 in your psalm books today. I know whom I believe. Page number 442. I know. service over to the pastor this morning. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to be in your house today. Lord, I'm glad I know that I know that I know this morning that my Redeemer liveth. And I pray, Lord, now you'll be in this service. Be with our speaker today, Brother Larry. Anoint him, speak through him today. Save the lost today. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for the word of God. Thank you for the blood of Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you're my risen Savior and that you're my coming King. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, Pastor. We're going to keep our, uh, our Bible classes inside here today, and so everybody will just stay in here. We're going to have an all-church Bible class time, and we've got Brother Larry Brown with us today, and uh, he's kind of quiet and reserved and, and s- slow, and you'll go to sleep if you're not careful, so do try to stay awake and punch your people beside you. Try to keep everybody awake while he's up here. But he's going to do a Bible class, and then he'll be preaching. Now, his wife and him are not getting along real good. She's sitting back there. He's sitting up here. And so we're hoping that they get reconciled before uh, before church is over with today. But it's good to have them. They come sliding in last night about uh, 7.30, and uh, we had some good fellowship and then breakfast this morning. And Brother Larry is with us today, and we're glad, and his wife, Rhonda. And they drove all the way down from Washington, Iowa. They are headed down to Branson to another church to preach tonight. Is that right? And he said, Reggie, I've got the morning open. I said, well, you don't now. So you come on. So, Brother Larry, I want you to come on and preach for us this morning. Or he's going to have Bible class and then preach later. But, by the way, while he's coming, I'll just say a couple of things. Uh, to all the heathen uh, Zins and everybody that's out in Colorado, this message, everything's for you because we're all good. 
bunch of heathen out there in the mountains. I'll tell you what. Now, if I go, I'm on vacation, but if they go, it's something else. Also, this morning, I would really appreciate if you'd keep the Leon Hopper family in prayer. Leon passed away. A lot of people in this church are related to uh, Brother Leon. And just hold that family up in prayer, just, just if you don't mind. And I'm probably letting you know about services later on. I'm not sure what, what's going on there. But anyway, also before he comes, uh, many of you know, and I'll let Larry say a little bit about this, but he gave me a little book that he's written uh, about... And the name of it is I Do Again. And it's about having lost his first wife and then remarried. And uh, if you're in that situation, I, we told him about your guys' married. But a little booklet there if you've lost your spouse and, and so forth. And uh, I haven't read it yet. Probably no good. But he wrote it anyway. And, and uh, I, got, I never quit out of your back. You do. I never quit out. Come on, Brother Larry. And uh, get at it and, uh, and roll and go. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. Second Timothy chapter number one, please, in your Bibles, as quickly as you can get there, and we're going to be off and running into the message. It's wonderful to be back here. Always a good place to go. Independent, fundamental, premillennial, temperamental, Jesus-loving, devil-hating, heaven-exalting, hell-dethroning church. I like that. It didn't change anything. I like that. Uh, change and decay and all around I see, but all oh, thou that changest not abide with me. It's good to be here. And my wife and I are not having problems. Uh, when I came into the auditorium, I could not find her. And so I sat down beside the preacher. That's a, quite a humiliation to have to sit down beside of somebody that looks like Brother Reggie when I could sit down beside of somebody that looks like Rhonda. And, uh, but, uh, I, matter of fact, still haven't found her. Is she in here? There you are. Good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Rhonda and I, we, uh, we, we're still on our honeymoon. Uh, we really are. We're like two runaway teenagers. We're having the time of our life. I mean, we're as happy as a raccoon in the cornfield with the hound dogs tied right now. I mean, really. And uh, you don't have time. We're not, you know, we're not uh, spring chickens. We know that. But we do know this. We're not near as bad as some people. One old couple had been married a little over 60 years. And they had had a long, tiring day. And they went in the bedroom. And he went over and sat down in the chair just trying to muster up enough carriage to get ready to go to bed. By the way, somebody said not long ago, they said, my wife and I are getting old and we know how we're getting old. We're getting old because we will say to each other, let's get ready to go to bed. <laughs> he said, we didn't used to get ready to go to bed. We just went to bed, but now we got to get ready to go to bed. And uh, so anyway, he went over and sat down in the chair there, just kind of uh, resting a little until he could get up and get ready to go to bed. Well, she was weary too, and she walked over by the dresser, and she opened the dresser drawer, and she reached up and took her glasses off and placed them in the drawer. And then she reached up and took her bracelet off and placed it in the drawer, and she took her watch off and placed it in the drawer. Then she took her necklace off and placed it in the drawer. Then she uh, uh, reached up and took her left earring off and placed it in the drawer and her right earring off and placed it in the drawer. Then she took her left hearing aid out and placed it in the drawer and her right hearing aid out and placed it in the drawer. Then she reached up and took her upper dentures out and placed them in the drawer. Then she reached up and took her lower dentures out and placed them in the drawer. Then she reached up and took her wig off and placed it in the drawer. Then she reached down and unscrewed her left leg and placed it neatly in the drawer. And because she only had one leg to stand on, she just fell like a crashing tree right over in the bed. Well, he's still standing in the chair like this looking at her. She said, would you mind telling me why you're sitting there staring at me that way? He said, oh yeah, I'll tell you. I'm just sitting here trying to figure out whether I'm supposed to get in the bed or get in the drawer. I don't know. Until <laughs> one place or the other. <laughs> about as much of that woman in one place as it was the other, you know, and he's, he's trying to figure out what his role in this marriage should be. But praise the Lord anyway. Now here's something from everybody. Uh, here's, here's a truth for everybody. And the fellow was going down through Kentucky years ago, and honest to goodness, there was a huge sign. And it was a, a horse riding stable where you could rent a horse to ride. And here's what it said. You may rent a horse to ride here. You may rent a horse for one hour, three hours, or all day. And uh, then underneath that, in small letters, it had these words. We have a horse for everybody. We have tall horses for tall people and short horses for short people. We have old horses for old people and young horses for young people. 
We have fast horses for fast people and slower horses for the more docile people. And for those that have never ridden horses before, we have horses that have never been ridden before. I mean, we just got a horse for everybody. And uh, there's something here in this message for everybody. And uh, so let's take a look at it. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. I hate to interrupt your comfort zone and you look so comfortable, but I'm going to have you stand up as I read these two verses, if you don't mind. 2 Timothy chapter chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, and uh, I, was t- I leaned over and said to your pastor as you were singing this song, I know whom I have believed, and I said, you're not going to believe the song we're singing for the text for my Sunday school lesson. Here it is, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12 and 13, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Now that phrase, hold fast the form of sound words, really ties in to verse number 12. Because you wouldn't believe it after preaching 40 years I was still misquoting this verse. Here's the way I'd quote it. The Apostle Paul said, For I know in whom I have believed and am persuaded. He didn't say that. He said, I know whom I have believed, meaning that I believe the one who spoke and I believe what he said. I believe him. Not just believe in him, and I do believe you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved, but that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about, I know whom I have believed. I know who I listened to, I know what he said, and I know what I believe. And uh, so the subject that I'm going to be covering in Sunday school, and this is not preaching time, but uh, all good teaching has some preaching in it, and all good preaching has some teaching in it. And so with that in mind, what I'm going to do this morning is not... This is not a message on salvation. This is a message on assurance of salvation. With that in mind, let's bow our heads in prayer. Holy Spirit of God, how wonderful, wonderful that we can not only be saved, but that we can know that we're saved. And the Apostle Paul said here, I know in whom I have believed, I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded. He was convinced in his soul. He was persuaded or swept to a truth that he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day and that is our souls we have committed the keeping of our souls unto him unto the unto eternal days and I pray Lord Jesus that you'll bless us now as we uh, preach this message and teach this truth in Jesus name amen you may be seated please Hebrews 10 22 said us let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Hebrews 6.11 show the same diligence to the assurance of faith. And we're talking about the assurance of faith. We're talking about the assurance of salvation. First, 2 Peter 1 verse 5 through 7 plainly tells us that people can be saved and not know that they're saved. Very clearly, and I will read that to you lest you doubt that. It says, and besides all this, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to godly brother, uh, godliness brotherly kindness. For if these things be in you and abound they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sin. He forgot that he was saved. And when you go to uh, 1 John, you read these words, He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And notice what he said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son. Of God. Now, these are people already saved. They have believed on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. So, I'm writing to people that are saved. 
so that they will know, have this full assurance of salvation. Fanny Crosby wrote, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Isn't it that wonderful peace that you have when you're persuaded, like the Apostle Paul, that you're saved? When you have that full assurance. But oh, the torment of mind and soul when you're not sure that you're saved. I've been preaching 57 years, and I've circled around the greatest of the greats of preachers and laymen and people. I've been walking in and out of church, churches similar to this, and believe and practice for 57 years. And I'm convinced that most Christians at some point in their life doubt their salvation. Satan comes, he's a liar, he's an accuser of the brethren, and he will come to create doubt. My pastor, Pastor Bobby Robertson, seventh grade education, uh, took a church running 150, stayed there nearly 60 years and built it to an average of 3,000 independent, fundamental, uh, independent Baptist church standing for the old time religion. Seventh grade education and and uh, one of the most powerful preachers I ever knew, but he went through times he would doubt his salvation. But he got victory. And I'm going to tell you how he got victory in the message this morning and how you can have victory. And I, I, I got saved when I was 18 years old, and I doubted my salvation. Uh, it was quite a while. I didn't doubt at all. I mean, I was just overwhelmed with the knowledge that, man, I'm born again. The Holy Spirit of God I knew was bearing witness to certain things. My life changed. My desires changed. And I I was glad, never thought about doubting, but sometime after that, I went through a difficult time, and the devil began to make me doubt, are you saved? Are you really, really saved? I remember going out on some winter visitation, and I was sitting down in a home, a man and his wife was there, and they had a 16-year-old girl, and I was just, uh, I got saved when I was 18, so I guess I was about 20 years old at this time, and uh, I was talking to this girl, and she was having, she didn't know for sure whether she was saved or not. And I pointed my finger at her and I said, you need to know that you're saved. And when I said that, it was like I saw this big finger coming back at me and it says, you need to know that you're saved. And oh boy, oh boy, oh the misery, uh, the discomfort. It's enough to scare you to death when you think about hell and you think about the fact we're one heartbeat from eternity. And then if you got any question or doubt about whether you're saved or you really got saved or whatever, that is enough to torment your mind and soul. And so I want to preach to you this morning a little bit on, uh, on how you can have full assurance of salvation. Now here's the first thing you got to do. I want you to notice verse 12. For the, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I know whom I have believed. He had an anchor. Watch me now. He had an anchor outside of himself. Yes. Now listen. Here's a ship. A ship out at sea. But it comes into harbor. And when it floats into harbor, into the channel... It's there. It's not going anywhere as far as back out to sea until they give it command to pull out. But it's still moving. Slowly it's moving. In the harbor, it's moving. So you decide you don't like that. And you decide you don't want it to move at all. And you're going to anchor that ship. So you go over and take a chain much bigger than this little plastic chain I have. But you go over and take a chain. And you go up to the front of the ship and you anchor around that great big anvil anchor at the front of the ship. And you say, I'm going to stop this. I'm going to stop this movement. People can't even get off the ship. They have danger of falling in the water. And you take this chain and you go to the back of the ship and you anchor to the back of the ship. And you take that winch and crank that thing down until that chain is as solid as a tabletop. But it don't make any difference. The ship's still moving. Then you decide, I'm not putting up with this. So you take the chain, been anchored to the front anchor, and you run it entirely around the pilot house. The whole thing. And tighten it down and anchor it down. Still moving. Don't make any difference in the world. You haven't helped one thing. You say, okay, we're going to settle this one. 
So you take it from the anchor in the front, you run it down the galley all the way to the, to the bottom of the ship and get around that huge engine. And you anchor around the engine and tighten it with a winch, but it's still moving. Because you're anchoring inside the ship. But if you can take that chain, and if you can go outside the ship and anchor to something outside the ship that's on solid ground, and then crank it down, that ship ain't going nowhere. It's not going to move. And your problem is you're trying to anchor within yourself. Did I really mean it when I pray? Did I say the right words? As a matter of fact, I'm not sure I can remember what I said, many people will say. Uh, was I really sincere? I, I didn't feel anything. Uh, uh, did I feel the right thing? There is no assurance when you're trying to anchor within your ship. You've got to anchor to something outside the ship. Uh, let me just say this. Paul said, I know whom I have believed. Salvation and assurance is entirely two separate things. You've got to anchor outside of your ship to something that does not move. Feelings coming, feelings going, feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the Word of God. Naught else is worth believing. Uh, my first wife, who came here more than one time, and to whom I was married 39 years, and died at age 58 with cancer. My first wife, as a little 10-year-old girl in the Methodist church, went forward. Nobody showed her any verses at that time, and sh nobody showed her how to be saved, but some laymen had come through that had gotten saved, Methodist men, laymen, and they were having a, 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 whatever you call it, and these men were getting up, giving their testimony about how they got saved, and they were saved, most likely, professed to be, no reason to believe they weren't. Well, when they gave their testimony, my wife, as a little 10-year-old girl, heard that, and in her inside, she said, I need to be saved. I need the Lord in my life. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure she even knew how to use the word saved. And she said, I went forward, and I knelt at the altar, and I said, Lord, if you don't help me, I'll never make it through this life. She said, I remember those were the words I said. Now, the words she said had absolutely nothing to do with salvation. But what she did, did have something to do with salvation. She was coming to the Lord. Now, later the devil tried to make her doubt, but she came back to this anchor. Jesus said, him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. She was coming to the Lord. She was a sinner. She knew she was a sinner. And she was coming to the Lord to be saved. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. And you know, later, as she grew in grace and got in a good, independent, Bible-believing church, she, she grew in grace, but she... She kept looking back to that time when I came to the Lord and I wanted to be saved and God made a promise. Did you ever stop and think about the thief on the cross? When he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That thief said absolutely nothing doctrinally right. The kingdom was not about to be set up. That's what everybody thought. They were looking for a king and looking for a kingdom. But you cannot have a king and a kingdom if you keep rejecting the Savior, the king. So they rejected the king and nailed him to the cross. So the kingdom was not canceled, but it was postponed. And it's still coming, by the way, someday. But, but here's what you would need to understand. That thief on the cross thought the kingdom was about to be set up. And he said, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, would you remember me? Now, he had been cursing. The Bible says that both of those thieves cast the same in his teeth, meaning curse Christ. But at some point there, he saw himself to be a sinner, and he realized the one hanging on the cross was innocent. And he told the other thief, after he had cursed and denied God, he told the other thief, he says, we received the just recompense of our reward, but this man hath done nothing. And he saw him as Lord. And he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom.
And when he said that, he didn't pray the right prayer. You know, the Lord didn't even stop and say, son, you got your doctrine wrong. <laughs> you got your doctrine. I'm not going to set up a kingdom now. Man, this is, I'm going to start the church age. It's the age of grace. This is the age of grace. The kingdom won't be set up uh, for a, uh, several centuries yet. No, the Lord didn't even correct him. He didn't worry about that. He knew that he was wanting to be saved. He was turning to him. He was receiving Christ. And Jesus said this, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. We know that man went to heaven. We know that he went to heaven because Jesus said he went to heaven. This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. And you've got to anchor outside the ship. And you've got to know where your anchor point is. You've got to do that. Um, I like this verse in 1 John, well, I've already covered 1 John 5, 10. And, uh, you know, somebody said, well, Pastor Brown, what if something goes wrong? What if some way I'm mistaken about my salvation? You know, I heard a story years ago, and I really liked it. The story was of a, a fishing boat. And 50 or 60 people on a fishing boat out in the ocean. I've been on several of them. The last two times I went, I got sicker than a mule and decided it wasn't worth it. But anyway, uh, it was on this fishing boat and a storm overtook the boat, which commonly happens on, on the water. It's, 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 it happened suddenly and it got bad. And it got bad quick and it got real bad quick and people were scared to death. And people were praying and people were crying and people thought they were going to die. And there was a little boy sitting on a bench right up against the, the tower house there. And he just sat there just as calm as a leaf. And um, a man walked by and said, son, aren't you afraid? He said, no, sir, not afraid at all. He said, why aren't you afraid? He said, well, it's like this. My daddy pilots this ship. And he said, I started to get afraid a while ago. But I, I, I took that little trip around and caught the steps and went up to the pilot wheel where my daddy was. And I said, Daddy, what do you think? And said, my daddy looked at me and said, Son, everything is going to be fine. We're going to be safe. So he said, I'm not worried about it. He didn't get any assurance by looking at the storm. He didn't get any assurance by listening to the howl of the wind. He didn't get any assurance to look at all the people falling apart all around him. But he got assurance from what his father said. Salvation comes by the blood. Assurance comes by the Word of God. And you've got to understand those two things. And somebody said, well, what if something goes wrong? <laughs> I love this, John 12, verse 47, 48. Jesus said in relation, direct relation to salvation, here's what he said. The Word that I have spoken unto you, the same shall judge you in that day. So what you believe in this word will be your judgment point when you stand before the throne of God. I love this verse in Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast, not to our salvation. Thank God my salvation doesn't depend on me holding on to it. But let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that is promised. Uh, I, I don't spend my time trying to confuse Christian people about whether they're really saved or not. I don't do that. Some preachers do, but I don't do that. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. Hold fast the profession of your faith without way. I spend my time trying to help Christians that are born again, who have come to the Lord and asked Him to save them, to have assurance of their salvation and to hold fast of their salvation. Here's the second thing. You've got to discover the difference between relationship and fellowship. Relationship and fellowship. Let me take this watch off here so I don't go over after a while. Uh, relationship is by blood and cannot change. Fellowship is by obedience and may change. I, I pastor in a small town. And I went there, 6,500 people, uh, relatively small town in Iowa. Uh, 13,000 in my entire county. And um, started a church 47 years ago. And uh, God blessed it. But anyway... Um, there was a, several other churches in our little town, and one of them was a Nazarene church. And the Nazarene church was pastored by a young man by the name of Rod Thelander. 
And Rod heard that I preached the holiness of God. And he liked that because Nazarenes, at least then, were known for the doctrine of holiness. They championed holiness. So he heard about that, and he came down and got a couple of my sermons. So the secretary said. And he left with them, and he came back the next week and got some more. So he started coming every Monday morning and picking up copies of what I'd preached on Sunday. And I met him, one of the sweetest fellas in the world. One of the sweetest guys in the world. And I believe Rod was saved. And he said, uh, I, I'd go out and say, hey, Rod, you still getting those sermons of mine? He said, yeah. I said, you better watch what you're doing. You're going to get fouled up on doctrine. Did you understand me, son? He'd laugh, and I'd laugh. And I could tell he had a good spirit. He wasn't argumentative. He, he, he was searching for the truth. And they believe a doctrine of entire sanctification. After you're saved, you have an experience whereby you are sanctified and you don't sin anymore. And so, one day I was going to Iowa City, and I had a thought. I called Rod. I said, hey, Rod, i got to go to the university hospital and make a couple of visits. Why don't you go with me? Sure. I said, we'll fellowship. He said, sure. I picked him up and went to Iowa City. And conversation came up. I said, Rod, you say you've never sinned since you've been saved. He said, I've never sinned since I've been sanctified. I said, that's amazing. I said, let me ask you this, Rod. We'd pulled up stoplight there in Iowa City, and the university students had just come back, and it was still a hot, a real hot day. And here's droves of these young ladies crossing the street in front of us at the stoplight, and they were disgracefully dressed. And I said, Rod, let me ask you a question. You come up here and visit the hospitals a lot, don't you? He said, I do. I said, well, tell me something. Can you look me in the eye and tell me that you never looked at a girl up here in this town and had a thought that was impure? He stared me in the eye and he said, no, I couldn't say that. I said, well, Rod, do you think a man ought to confess stuff like that? He said, well, he should, shouldn't he? I said, yeah, he should. I said, well, Rod, when you confess it, what do you confess it as? He didn't say anything. And you know what I said? Nothing. There's a virtue in knowing when to speak, and there's a virtue in knowing when to shut up. And so I didn't say anything. And a little bit later we were talking, I said, Rod, you, I've met your wife, and she, they were still in their late 20s, and they were just, I mean, you could look at them and tell they had a wonderful relationship. And I said, Rod... You and your wife are the image of what a couple ought to be. People can look at you and tell you got a good marriage, you love the Lord, you love each other, got two little children. I said, tell me something. I said, in spite of that, have you ever spoken to your wife in a way that you shouldn't have spoken to her? Can you look me in the eye and tell me that you have never spoken with an ill spirit towards your wife? He said, no, I, I couldn't say that. I said, well, Rod, when you confess that, do you think a man ought to confess it? He said, well, he should, shouldn't he? I said, yeah, he should. I said, when you confess that, what do you confess it as? And here's what he said to me. He said, well, Brother Brown, we believe that those type things are just covered by the blood. I said, Rod... You and I are living the same life as far as holiness is concerned. I'm struggling to live holy, and you're struggling to live holy. But the difference between your doctrine and my doctrine is this. You, you excuse your sin. I have to confess mine. I said, that's the difference between you and me. You, you excuse your sin. I have to confess mine. I said, Rod, I've got seven children. Those seven children are mine in two ways. They're mine by blood, by birth, and they're mine by obedience. They're mine by blood, and that cannot change. I was in the delivery room when all seven of them were born. I know they're mine, and I know who their mother is, and I know who their daddy is, and they're mine. And I said, I'm going to tell you something. Those children should live right. But I said, if they don't live right, it doesn't change by blood what has happened. 
I said, they can decide they're going to move to the other side of the world and disown me and disclaim me and disobey me and don't ever see me again. But it's not going to change any doctor in the world can draw blood and prove that they're my child, they're born to me, they're, they're my child. That cannot change. You know, when Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again, Nicodemus, was, he was trying to understand, Lord, can a man enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? No, you, can't, you cannot go back and get born the second time physically. You need to be born in the spirit the second time. And so the point that, the point that I made to him was, I said, but no, wait a minute. They're, my, they're also mine by obedience. And I said, if they disobey me, and if they don't do what I say, the fellowship is broken, but the sonship stays the same. He got real quiet. He'd been through Nazarene College. He'd pastored several years. He grew up in the Nazarene culture. He looked at me, he said, Brother Brown, in my lifetime, I have never had anybody explain that to me. You know what I said then? Nothing. Nothing. Amen? I said nothing. I mean, it's time you need to shut people up to God. And I said absolutely nothing. Now, here's what I'm saying. You've got to understand the difference between relationship and fellowship. And just because, look, you messed up, and nobody should mess up, and everybody should live holy, but you stumbled, you failed, you did wrong, you spoke wrong, you thought wrong, you acted wrong, you looked at something you shouldn't have done, and you did, said something, did something you shouldn't have done, and now you don't know whether you're saved or not. Look, don't try to get assurance by the blood. You got salvation by the blood, get assurance by the Word. Let me illustrate this. You need, to, you need to discover where assurance comes from. In Exodus chapter 12, verse number 7, listen to these words. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it from the sheep and from the goats. Now listen to what he said. The death angel is about to pass over. The firstborn in every family is going to die that don't have the blood on the doorpost. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorpost of the houses wherein they shall eat. So the blood is to go on both sides of the doorpost and over the top doorpost, which is, by the way is a picture of the cross. Okay? Now, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are and when I see the blood, Jesus, the Lord said, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. I'm going to pass over that house. I'm going to skip that house. And I'm going to go to some house that don't have blood on it. And the death angel is going to take the firstborn child. Now picture this. A father goes out and he puts the blood on the doorpost. And they lay down that night. But he's got a little 10-year-old boy. And just before daddy goes to sleep, he hears this little fellow. <laughs> he gets up and goes in his room and says, son, what's the problem? He said, dad, it's tonight the night. He said, yeah, tonight's the night. I mean, the death angel's going to pass over tonight. <laughs> Did he say that the firstborn would die? Everybody don't have the blood on the doorpost. Firstborn's going to die. <laughs> daddy, I'm scared. He said, son, there's nothing to be scared about. He said, well, I'm scared anyway. He said, I put the blood on the doorpost. He said, I know, but what if something goes wrong? We're scared. He said, um, son, get up. Put your, put your robe on. Come on, follow me. And they went out of the house on the outside. And he held the lamp up beside the doorpost. He said, you see that blood? He said, I see it, and I saw it when I came in tonight. And I know you put the blood up there, but it's still scary to me to think about a death angel coming over. And what if something goes wrong? And, and, and what? I'm the firstborn, Dad. I'm the firstborn. Now, here's what the daddy said. He said, listen to what God said about that blood. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You see that right there, son? It says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. You know who said that, son? No, God said that. God said he would not bother you. You got it right here. God said he would pass over this house and he would not trouble anybody in this house. 
You're the firstborn and you're saved not just because we put the blood up there. Oh, that makes you saved. The blood makes you safe. But the Word makes you sure. He didn't get assurance of salvation because the blood was on the doorpost. He got assurance of salvation because of what God said about the blood. Man, I'm telling you what. If that don't light your fire, your wood's wet. Sure as this world. And uh, so, uh, the blood makes you saved. The blood does not make you sure. It makes you saved. But the Word of God makes you sure. What God said about it. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded, Paul said. I've got an inward swept awareness to a fact that I'm holding, I can grip and know. I know, in who, I know whom I have believed. And uh, so, uh, it's what, what he did, Paul said, is what God said about what he did, about the, the, the blood of Jesus Christ. And then, let me just say this. You need to find that peace. You need to find that wonderful peace. Uh, <laughs> I was on an airplane some years ago. I was getting ready to study. I make use of the time when I fly. My wife and I fly a whole lot. We fly everywhere. We stay in the air more than a seagull with sore feet. We fly everywhere. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so, but anyway, I was, I was alone this time. This is before I met Rhonda. And I was sitting on the plane. And uh, here's what I heard. I looked around, and sitting behind me, diagonal across uh, one seat back on the other side, was a young lady who looked like maybe in her 30s, and she was staring out the window, tears. Well, I thought maybe she'd gone through some sorrow, lost a loved one or something, but I saw her look around, and it dawned on me she was scared to death. So I said to her, I said, ma'am, people listening, I said, ma'am, are you afraid of flying? I'm scared to death, she said. I said, have you ever flown before? No, that was my first time. I said, well, I can imagine it would be a little scary your first time. I said, I think I know something that could help you. She said, oh, I'm, anything, anything you could do to help me, I'm scared to death. I said, well, I think I know something to help you. I said, do you know who Lords of London is? She said, no. I said, Lords of London is the largest insurance company in the world. She said, is that right? I said, yes, ma'am. I said, do you know how they got to be the largest insurance company in the world? She said, no. I said, by proper risk assessment. If an insurance company sets the risk factor too high, they have to charge too much premium and they go out of business. The next insurance company takes over. If they set their, if they set their risk factor too low, then it, they go bankrupt. It costs them too much. So I said, they got to be the largest insurance company in the world because they mastered the art of proper risk assessment. They could look at any situation and determine whether that situation, uh, what the risk factor, the chances you are of being hurt or sick or die, whether it's life insurance or accident insurance or whatever it is. I said, did you know what Lords of London said about what you're doing right now? She said, no, I don't know. I said, Lords of London has assessed that you're 25 times safer in this commercial jet per mile than you are on the ground. You can travel 25 miles in this jet, cover 25 miles, before you can cover one mile in a car on the ground, and you can be safer in the plane 25 miles than you're in the car one mile. She said, really? I said, do you know what they say is the most dangerous thing you've done this morning about flying? She said, no, I don't know. I said, Lords of London says the most dangerous thing you've done this morning about flying is your trip to the airport. They say the most dangerous part of flying is getting to and from the airport. And I saw her tears dry up, and she said, that's wonderful. <laughs> now, I want to ask you a question. I'm sitting there getting ready to study. I hadn't even thought about the plane. 
But I always pray before I take off. I always, we, pray, we prayed yesterday before we left on this trip. Pray the Lord protect our car and give us, and pray every time I fly. But I want to ask you a question. I'm as calm as I can be, and she's a nervous wreck. Which one of us is the safest? We're both on the same plane. Which one of us is the safest? I'm as safe as she is, she's as safe as I am, but she's not enjoying the ride. Because she don't have assurance of her safety. But she got assurance of safety based on facts. And brother, let me tell you something. Lords of London is a great insurance company, but they are not as solid with their facts as this blessed old book right here. And you can rest on exactly what God said. Now let me just say this. Sometimes you can have full assurance in a false hope. Now, I've spent my time building a case for your assurance of salvation. You say, you can have full assurance in something that is wrong. And the reason I know this is because I've knocked on thousands of doors over the years just telling people about the Lord. And I don't know how many times I've had people say to me, well, we're very comfortable with our religion, thank you. We're very comfortable with our religion. They could be Jehovah's Witness. Uh, that doesn't, they do not believe that Jesus is God. I believe a whole lot of people that don't espouse Faith Liberty Church or my church, the Marion Avenue Baptist Church, I believe there's a whole lot of people that are not members of our churches that are going to heaven. But there is nobody in this world that denies God going to heaven. And Jesus is God. And uh, I, uh, so anyway, and, and then people that just have church. Well, I'm, you know, I've asked, said, do you know you're going to heaven when you, oh yes, uh, I'm a deacon down here in this certain church. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I teach in this church. I do this, I do that. It's not what you do that takes you to heaven. It's what God does for you. And sometimes you can have full assurance of that which is wrong. We feel comfortable with our religion. Ruth Jones said, in times like these you need a savior. In times like these you need an anchor. Be sure, be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. Charles Hatton Spurgeon visited one of his members years ago. And she was dying. And they used the term in those days, sinking. When you're dying, you are sinking. Are you sinking? And Dr. Spurgeon looked over this lady, member of his church, and said, Ms. Jones, are you sinking? And she looked up with weary eyes and said, Pastor... Did you ever hear of anybody sinking through a rock? <laughs> sinking through a rock. I heard a sweet story. A little fellow was caught out in the ocean and waves swept others away. And he was holding on to a boulder. And the waves were just about to knock him off the boulder. And they found him. He was drenched. He was nearly drowned and drenched. He was cold. He was trembling. And as they wrapped him up, they said, Son, were you afraid? He said, Yes, I was afraid. They said, Were you cold? He said, Yes, I was cold. They said, Did you tremble? He said, I trembled all night. But he said, The rock never did. Amen. The rock never did. And the rock... Our Savior will never, ever tremble under us. I could be speaking to somebody here this morning. You're trusting something besides the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross for your salvation. You're f trusting a false hope. You have an experience. Uh, the, the college for transcendental meditation is 35 minutes from where I live, Fairfield, Iowa. These people have an experience. They really do. They have an experience. And, uh, and, and when a person has an experience, they trust this inward assurance that they're okay. But again, the devil will give you a good feeling every day of your life if he can do that to take you to hell. And you need to trust Jesus and Him alone. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. I boarded a plane in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm sitting on the plane. And there was a lady got on the plane behind me with her mother. Her mother was elderly. 
And uh, I could hear them talking. I was busy and all of a sudden I could hear them talking. This lady was trying to assure her mother that everything was going to be all right. Her mother never flown before. And her mother was getting deathly quiet and she was really concerned about it. And the, and the girl, her daughter, was just comforting her and telling her all the good things and, you know, trying to get her mind on pleasant things. Well, anyway, I went ahead about my study. And in a little bit, the pilot pulled that throttle and down the runway she went. And when that nose came up and that, those landing wheels bumped off the runway, I heard in low, subtle tones this voice behind me saying, Well, it's in God's hands now. <laughs> <laughs> and until you have assurance that it's in God's hands that you've trusted Him and Him alone then uh, you cannot know for double dead dog sure that when you die you are going to heaven Amen I'm early brother Reggie you want to come and teach something or finish out or ask a question or whatever in the world you want to do it's all yours yeah I tell you what, when I well, I'll make up for it in the next service. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I've got something to say, and when I get done saying it, I quit. I tell people everywhere. When I get done, I'll quit. I'm done. I'll quit. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think it'd be a good time just to uh, maybe have some testimonies about your struggles. And uh, how many got some help out of this today? I did. I got a lot of help out of it. I tell you what. The devil will, he, he, he'll just, he'll throw that at you constantly about uh, trying to tear down your assurance and uh, that Christ is not enough and it's how, how you're performing and how you're doing. But I'm glad we can rest on the solid rock, amen? amen. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. Amen. All of the ground is sinking sands. Anybody got a testimony about maybe something that you, you know, struggle with? Maybe you're out here and say, you know what, Reg, this helped me today because I've been struggling. Anybody got any testimony and comments, any thought of that nature? While we've still got a little time this morning. Glad to welcome everybody online. Uh, we are charging today for online viewing. <laughs> Not really, I'm just kidding. But we are glad to have y'all here. Boy, I taste good to see you folks back. You've had a storm, ain't you? Good to see y'all back. Y'all growed about three or four inches while you was gone. But that, uh, being chicken pox didn't stop you from growing, did it? Good to see you. Anybody got any thoughts or anything this morning about uh, the, the message today? You're awful quiet. Yes, Dean. It's uh, one thing that amazed me through my life. And I don't know why I didn't grasp it until I got a lot older. But uh, where the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee. Yeah. It don't say fight him. Yeah. It don't say you've got to just claw tooth and nail. Just resist him. Just resist him. And he's a coward. He'll flee. Yeah. God says it and it happens. It works that way. Rest on his word. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what he said was a really good reminder for me, even just yesterday, telling somebody about my testimony. Yeah. You know, coming back and saying, you don't remember any of that. Let me just, you bet you, just say this, encourage you. As long as your thought processes think that everything, that is, in any degree, that your salvation depends upon your performance, you'll never have peace. You'll never have peace. Now, I, I, I think that a man ought to really examine himself. The Bible says examine yourself to see whether he be in the faith. One of the worst things you can have is false assurance. Uh, he was talking about visiting people. They'll, uh, my experience is they'll say, well, I was baptized in 1979. And they'll say, you'll, hardly, you'll hear everything except I was born again. And I, place, and I trust Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection for my salvation. I, I would add this to what he said. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in our place for our sins. And it's believing the gospel that saves you. Trusting in that finished work of Jesus Christ. And, the, and if you're here today and you're like, you know, you're sitting here going, you know what? Well, this really spoke to me. You just, you know, I've had people deal with this a lot. You can't preach and pastor church without dealing with this quite a bit. And you know what I tell people this? I, I, if you don't think you're saved... Why don't you just ask him right now, God save me. 
I mean, if you, I don't know what else you're going to do. But I did like that story about the, who's the most safe. The one who's worrying. Brother Lutz, how are you doing? Boy, I bl bless your heart. It's good to see you. I was concerned about you. And especially you know, when I didn't get no answer on the phone, I was concerned. Like, Boy, he must be sick. And, uh, and he was probably like me. He's sick. He's just kind of like an old cow. You go off in the woods and want to be left alone. Anybody else got any thoughts about, uh, uh, yes, Tommy, way back there. Uh, in my walk with Christ, when I recognize that my performance and how, how that might get me to heaven, when I recognize this, what it was, was self-righteousness, mm, yep. boy, that, that's a game changer. Yes, it is. When we recognize that all of our righteousnesses, plural, is as filthy rags. Then all of a sudden we've got to find righteousness and that's you find it in Jesus Christ. And his righteousness is imputed to us when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. Somebody else had a hand. I got one over here and then I'll get you. Yes. I just wanted to say that probably most of the kids, our kids, have come to us at some point and said, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm like, no problem. Sit down. Yeah. And you take the word. I said, I'm supposed to just drive it a mile deep. You know that you know. You know. And I don't have a problem. I want them to come to me. You bet. And, and say that. And so we just deal with it. It's not something like they keep coming to me. But it's like when they're this age versus this age. Just square it away and, and yeah. you know what you know. I, I would just really encourage you to listen to what he said. Deal with it. Yeah. Don't just sit there and wallow in it for years. Let's say, Lord, I've got to get this thing settled. Now, I'll tell you, I might, and I'll get you in just a second. I was reading my Bible in, in the old study off the mobile home we used to live in, and I read 1 John chapter 5. This is the record. God hath given. I didn't earn it. I didn't merit it. But he gave me eternal life. And you know, I said, if I was reading a Sears and Roebuck catalog, I'd kind of take it for what they say. Amen. I'm reading the Word of God, and it said eternal life. If it's eternal, it's eternal. Amen. And God can't lie. And he said, these things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know, not wonder, not worry, that you have eternal life. And he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now, I want to throw something at you, and Brother Brown, you may get under, but I'm going to get him first, and then we're going to remind me to ask you a question. Go ahead. I, I'm, I'm just thankful for the truth, the King hey, James Bible. Hey. Uh, I was raised like you, and me and my wife just talked about this yesterday. I was so unsure about my salvation, and, and I got to a point where I was indoctrinating it. We were into our older children. It's not just loving God and following the Word. You've got to be this certain way. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. So I only realize that it took tragedy in our life to realize that we're filthy rags at best and there's nothing we can do. And I'm just thankful that all these children in here today and all these grown people have the opportunity to hear the truth. Because in the Mormon church, they're not preaching the truth. In these feel-good churches, they're not. And we have masses of people headed to hell because they think of their work. And there's nothing that we can do. All you children hear that today. It's not but you to believe on the Lord and believe this King James Bible. That is going to be your ticket. It'll never be what you can do or what your father can do or anyone else. I just, I just need to say that this is it. Amen. Boy, oh, Brother Brown forgot what I was going to ask you. Okay, hang on just a second. Across my Facebook feed this week came a statement. Uh, no one can take you out of God's hand, but you can take yourself out. Yeah. Address that. Well, if you're, if you're bigger than God is, you can take yourself out. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, he is, probably does. <laughs> Here's the problem with that, is uh, first of all, it would be saying that God didn't give you eternal life, that it was by some means stopped. 
And of course, there's all kinds of problems with this stuff that if you, if you could lose your salvation, then do you get reborn again? And, and at a, how do it, it, here's, here's what gets me. They don't know that you can be saved, but then they also don't seem to know if they're lost. And they'll say they can be lost, but they'll never tell you exactly when, where, and what it took. And so, but they say, well, you just know. Well, by what, you know? Bell's got any hand. Yes, sir, Andrew. Just going back to uh, we're saved by the blood and we get assurance by the word. Um, and just think of there's so many children here. And I was growing up in a Christian home as a child. Um, by whose word we are assured and just being so careful as parents to never assure by our own word when our kids come to us. Yes. Because they'll never be assured, you know. When you hear somebody say, well, my mom said I prayed at uh, this age. Mm-hmm. That's her word, yeah. not the word of God. Amen. That, uh, I'll just tell you something. Now, uh, let's just dive off the cliff here just a little bit. The Bible says the trial of your faith was much more precious than that of gold. I'm a strong believer that everybody says they're saved ain't saved. Amen. And here's why. There is fruit to salvation and James makes it very clearly that works, good works will follow salvation. And that if they don't, your faith is dead. Okay? That's your Bible. Just as much Bible as Ephesians 2, 9. By the way, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not, not of works, lest any man should boast. The next verse says, For we are, what? His workmanship cre- created unto good works. So to deny that there should not be fruits of holiness, fruits of obedience to the word of God, is just a lie. And I I don't buy into that stuff. And I'll just tell you right now, I'm going to say it. There's two extremes in this country and probably all over the world. One extreme is, uh, well, you can lose your salvation and it's all up to you in the end. That's wrong. But I'll tell you about The Bible says you can take the grace of God and turn it into lasciviousness. And I'm going to tell you this is a fact, and I'll I'll stand on this till till judgment day. What you're seeing preached in a lot of American churches about, oh, assurance of your salvation, yeah, you're saved, you got eternal life, and no obedience to God as a result of that. In other words, just say your little prayer, get baptized, put your name on the roll, go live like you want to. Just as long as you give offer and show up on Sunday morning, you'll never hear a word from us. I don't buy into that. I just don't buy into it. And I've seen that produce more false converts than anything you can imagine. And you can't win those people. They're hardened. It's sick. Jim. God's word is God's word. We, we had to watch like you, that thing you said, the uh, uh, no man could pluck you out of God's hands, but you could jump out or whatever. But you got to watch these things where we add to God's word or take yeah. away from it. But another yeah. one that's, that's commonly said is, uh, you know, when God shuts one door, he opens another. I mean, that's not scripture. But can you imagine telling that to somebody standing outside the ark? <laughs> <laughs> well, amen. Boy, that's good, ain't it? Uh, I, met, I met Brother Brown uh, at uh, Boyd, Boyd Hofford. Uh, Boyd is a unique character. He's my cousin, and he's just uh, he's one of a kind, like we all are. And uh, God has all kinds of preachers out there. And, uh, oh boy, he invited me up there in that country to preach and got acquainted with those people. And he had a Labor Day Jubilee back then. And for 26 or 7 years, I think it was, I went every Labor Day, drove up there or flew up there to preach right after service on Labor Day Sunday. I bet I'd been going there 15 years and I walked in the service and this little bald headed guy was up there preaching. He's just going like a wild man. And I kind of slipped in and I sat down and he just got started good and he's preaching on the hedge. Boy, did God get a hold of my heart and I found myself praying to God when that thing was over and seeking the Lord and, you know, just getting some help from God. He and I met. He handed me three or four cassette tapes. Boy, that's back in the day, amen. And we headed down the road, and, and God helped me. 
uh, Boyd introduced me to a lot of things that helped me in the ministry. He helped, Boyd Hopford probably helped this church more. It was by the people that he introduced me to and the things that he introduced me to that, that helped so much. But uh, after that, I, I stole three, four, five messages of Brother Brown's, preached them, stole them and told everybody out like that. Yeah, I come up with that myself. And, <laughs> no, I, I never did lie about it. Somebody asked me, I just tell them. And uh, then we had, it, had you down here. But I want to tell you something about this man today. I'm going to tell you why I respect him. I was going through a really hard time. And I left uh, church early. I left on a Saturday to go to the camp for Monday. And I told Karen, I said, I'm going to Brother Larry Brown's church. And I want to see what God's doing there. But I'm not going to tell him I'm coming. I don't want him to know. And we really didn't know each other very well. Had just met the one time, actually. And uh, I'm going to say a few straight things here, okay? And I went in then. There, I, I drove all night. Got up there and pulled into Washington I, Motel. And I said, ma'am, do you all got a room? She said, room? She said, there ain't a room within 200 miles here. I said, how come? She said, well, this old Thrasher's Day weekend. If you ain't never been to that, you need to go to that. But anyway... She sent me down another place, and they called somewhere, and they called a bar. And this old boy said, you still got that room above that bar? And they said, yeah. I said, well, i got a preacher here who wants that room. <laughs> <laughs> and I went and slept in a room above a bar. They, they shut down about 2 o'clock in the morning, finally. And the next morning, I got up, and I ate breakfast, went somewhere to ate breakfast, and I, I, I'm literally, it's honest truth. I did not have any intention of seeing him or other than from the pulpit. I didn't want to have a, quote, big walk in and go, oh, Brother Brown, I, mean, I wanted to learn and I wanted to deeply see what God was doing at that church and why. So I come in there and I sat way in the back. And if you ain't never been to this church, what was that church before you guys got it? It was the old Presbyterian church. Beautiful church. Beautiful church. And I sat in the very back row. Kind of be like, be like that, back where Sam's at. I sat in the very back row, and I'm sitting there, and people's in there and stuff, and I'm just kind of sliding down the seat there, and Larry jumps up, and he bounces up. Hey, good morning, and all that stuff, you know, and, and they sing, and it's all of a sudden, and he's doing this, and all of a sudden he goes, Brother Kelly, is that you? <laughs> and I kind, of, I kind of nodded like that. And I never what he said. He said, folks, in 25 years of passion, I've never done this. He said, have you got your gun loaded? He said, I'm going to have him preach for me this morning. I, literally, I, I'm be, you talking about causing you to tremble. There's, there's seven, I preached to 700 people that morning in that church service. And I mean, I, you know, I mean, I scared me to death. And I get up there, I don't even know what I preached on. Probably didn't amount to snap. But anyway, and now, here, now here's why this is a big deal to me. He's an independent fundamental Baptist. Are you listening to me? Most independent fundamental Baptists in this country won't have anything to do with me because I'm not a Baptist. And when I re the moment I respect that man was when he said, I'll have you preach, irregardless of your, your denominational attachment. And I knew there's something different going on. I knew, he, I knew he's plugged into God, not his denomination. There's a big difference between being plugged into God and plugged into your denomination. Let's stand and you reach. Oh, wait. Reach and get that blue book. <laughs> Pull it out of the back of the pew. Hold it close to your chest and come on and let's sing today. Lord, we thank you for this good time we've had in fellowship and the Word of God. Thank you for the great teaching of the Word of God today. Thank you for letting Brother Larry and his wife be with us. I pray, God, you help us to be a blessing to them. Help us, Lord, not just to take in, but help us to pour into their souls. Help us to be an encouragement to them, Heavenly Father, I pray. Now, God, I pray we're getting ready to sing. Holy Spirit, don't let us sing with half-heartedness. Don't let us just dribble through this thing. God, help us to lift up our hearts and our, our voices to thee today in joyful praise and worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Come on, let's sing.